Good morning. It's uh, good to be with you again today. It doesn't really matter where you're watching from. You're very welcome to this time that we are sharing together as we think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus in 2020. I want to read some words from the Old Testament as we begin our time today. And it's when the people of Israel had been wandering in the wilderness for a very long time and they were just at the point where they were going to cross over the River Jordan and into the land that God had promised to give them. It was a time of real uncertainty. They didn't know what the future would hold. They didn't know if they were going to be successful or not. They didn't know um, anything terribly much about uh, where they were to go. It's kind of like where we are today as church in lockdown. We're not very sure about the future. We're not very sure about what's going to happen. We don't know what the landscape is going to look like on the other side of the lockdown and of covid and so here are these words that uh, God, through Moses, spoke to the people. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Good words for us in these days. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Because God still goes with his people. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the reminder that you go with us. And it's not just that you send us out and you walk there. You've already been to those places you've called us to go. You are at work in the world, even although sometimes we don't see it. And you haven't stopped working just because our buildings happen to be closed at the moment. This situation that we find ourselves in was not a surprise to you. It didn't catch you off guard and leave you wondering what to do. You were already ahead of it. And as we have got ourselves organised and we've started to do things online, Father, we pray that you would help us to see wherever we are, wherever we're watching, that we are not on our own. Although we may be in different physical locations, we are still part of your church and we are still part of your kingdom. And your promise is still true that you go with us and therefore we shouldn't be afraid, we shouldn't be anxious, we shouldn't be worried and upset because you are with us and you never leave us. And so as we come together today for worship, we pray that that might be our experience. Not just as something we know in our heads, but something we know and understand as truth and reality in our hearts and in our lives. And Father, we are conscious that although we cannot do those things that we have done before, we are still called to serve you. So help us to look for those ways in which we are to be your people in these days. 
and as we think beyond this lockdown and what church might look like, would you give us wisdom and understanding? Would you give us vision and clarity of thought to find new maps, new ways, new paths into a future that is still uncertain? Ah, but Father, we thank you that you've already been and you already know the way. And so help us to follow. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so now we're going to sing a song about being the vine and the branches. And then we're going to hand over to Stephanie our families and children's worker to lead us in our Kingdom Kids talk. Welcome everyone. It's good to see you. I hope you are comfy and sit on your couch or seats ready for this kids talk. My name is Stephanie and I am the children's and families development worker. It was so good to see some of you last week and I know not all of you could join in unfortunately but don't worry we're gonna meet again next week for a new Zoomtastic meeting. So, looking forward to seeing you all again soon. Also, at Kingdom Kids, we had a little game going on. And some of you sent me the right answer. That was fantastic. Thank you all for participating in that great quiz. The correct word was prayer, as you knew. And the happy winners of our email sent in drawer were Ben and Rory. Yay! Congratulations to you. So happy. You will receive a little parcel as a prize soon. And to all of you who did not make the first prize, you will get a little thank you for participating because it was just great to have you send in an email and have you send in the correct answer. So don't be too sad. Now, the past weeks, we have been talking about the Beatitudes. Remember, the hard part 
of the first speech Jesus shares with his listeners and with his friends, the Beatitudes. And he starts the Beatitudes with blessed are. Blessed are. So we started doing a Beatitude wheel, Beatitude plate, and today we are going to finish it. So you can check out on our webpage, um, Kingdom Kids webpage, uh, how to make this Beatitude wheel if you would like to join and would like to do this craft. And uh, today you find the last part to finish it. So, blessed are. What, who is blessed today? Who is Jesus talking about? To give away what we are talking about today, I brought a symbol, a sign. And I bet some of you have seen the sign before and even know what it is. Here it comes. I bet some of you remember the sign. They, I'm sure some of you have seen it somewhere. It's the peace sign. You're correct. It's a sign for peace. But why? It's really interesting if you look into it because the peace sign actually speaks into a time when countries were getting very dangerous weapons to fight each other. And so the peace sign actually symbolizes two letters to speak against getting these armors, to speak against fighting with these dangerous nuclear armors. Yeah, so that is super interesting. You can read a bit more about it on our webpage if you like. And I'm sure that you've heard it said in school maybe or at home that it is so special that we live in a time of peace. For more than 50 years, you have peace. We have peace here. So peace is a pretty big deal. And not just between countries, it's also a pretty big deal in school or at home. We like to have peace in church, it's a central, that means a very important topic for us. But maybe if you have ever been in the position of making peace, that is a pretty tough business, isn't it? Once I had two friends and they were so angry and hurt by one another, and I was in position between them, and I realized how difficult it was to make peace. Making peace between friends or brother and sister can be really difficult. It is difficult not to take sides and it is difficult to help two opposing people to listen to one another and to reach hands. Hmm. If you want to make peace, you need a pure heart. That means you need a heart that does not seek selfish gain, what you can get out of it. It means that you need a heart that seeks God. Because God doesn't take sides and God loves everyone equally. I know that is really difficult to believe, but that's what Jesus teaches us. God loves everyone equally. And so we need a pure heart, a heart that looks for God, that seeks God's love in order to make peace. And so Jesus says, Jesus teaches in his first speech, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. That's why these two go together. In order to make peace, you need a pure heart. And the amazing thing is that 
If you make peace, you will be called a child of God. Jesus says when you are a peacemaker, when you have that pure heart, people will wonder and they will see your relationship with God. They will see that we are God's children. So I really want you to remember that. Learn it by heart. Blessed are the peacemaker, for they will be called children of God. Remember that you are a child of God. And when we make peace, people will see you are a child of God. Let us pray. Abba Father, I thank you for this promise. I thank you that you give us this fantastic promise that when we make peace, when we have a pure heart that seeks you, that seeks your love, and when we make peace, that we will be called children of God. People will see us as your children. I thank you for that. And I thank you that peace is such a central topic that you teach us to seek and to make peace. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. How good and pleasant it is and sisters live together in unity and peace. It is now time for you to pray for peace as a family. Pray for peace for your family, for countries, for people you know. And I will close this prayer with Amen. Amen. Good morning. Today's lesson is taken from John, chapter 15, reading verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Amen. I thank you to Leslie for doing the reading today. Over the past few weeks, we've been thinking about people who have either chosen themselves uh, to be isolated or have been isolated uh, due to the prejudice uh, of others or the circumstances they have found themselves in. Today, I want to think about the opposite scenario. I want us to think of the scenario where Jesus told his friends that they should stick with him. There are a number of different uh, Bible translations and, and they use different words for that. Remain, abide, stay connected. 
be joined, share life, live in union. All things that we've been unable to do with our family and friends over the past weeks. Humans are designed to be in relationship with other people. We are social beings. But we are also designed to be in relationship with God. And that's really what I want to talk about today. In our reading today, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a really important saying from Jesus. But when you see the context in which he speaks, it takes on even more significance. Just a couple of chapters earlier, we see Jesus and his disciples sharing the Last Supper together. And then in, in a few chapters further on, we see that Jesus is arrested and taken to be tried and crucified. So what we have here between chapter 13 and 18 is essentially after dinner conversation and prayer. It's the last chance that Jesus has to talk in this way to his friends. I want you to imagine if you knew that your next meal would be your last with your family and your friends, would you think about it for a bit? Would you think about what to eat or what to wear? Would you think about who gets to sit next to you? What would you want to say? How would you want to say it? Would you tell them that you loved them? What about sharing some life lessons that you've learned along the way? It's in this context that Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. We're going to hear that again and again today. But why is being connected important? Well, here are two plants, one of which is doing quite well and the other is not doing well at all. In the first verse of the reading, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. I think there are two types of vines that people try and connect to. There's things that actually lead to death. They don't work. People are, are so caught up with being successful. If I can just make enough money next year, if I can just have the right car, if I can get the right social status or the right technology, or if I can have the perfect family. But those are things that don't produce good fruit. And actually, when you chase it so hard, it leads to death. But staying connected with Jesus, we're told, is what leads to good fruit. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. What is the fruit then that staying connected to Jesus produces? It's the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the amazing things that are produced by Holy Spirit in the lives of his people. And at the moment between Ascension and Pentecost, we're joining with churches all over the world in uh, an event or a series of events called Thy Kingdom Come. And it's part of the prayer that Jesus taught his friends to pray. And it's asking that God would pour out his Holy Spirit on the earth, on us and on our friends and our families and our communities. So that we would see more of his kingdom in our lives and that we would see more of his fruit in the world. But that kind of fruit is not produced instantly. I don't know about you, but I sometimes look at myself and wonder where that fruit is. Perhaps, you know, there's been something you've been praying about for a long time and it's not happened. Maybe you still get angry very easily. 
Maybe you're prone to being proud and you wonder, well, where's the fruit? The thing is that unlike natural fruit, we are guaranteed that if we stay in this vine, that is Jesus, there will be fruit. If you want to be more patient, you need to exercise patience. Goodness grows when we choose to be good. Kindness comes when we are generous. But we don't get to choose which of these fruit we're going to have. This spiritual fruit isn't expected to look like one large grape with eight small ones round about it. We're expected to produce all of those fruits. And we do it by staying connected to Jesus. If you've ever watched or, or been to see vines, you know that they need to be pruned in order to keep them producing fruit. Spiritually, that's a painful thing to go through. Fruitful branches have bad spots, they have misdirected shoots, they have discoloured leaves, all of which need to be removed in order that the vine becomes fruitful. And we have things in our lives that limit our walk with Christ and therefore limit the fruit that we produce. And so there are some areas in which we might need pruning. There's our attitude. We can sometimes be judgmental and look down on other people. Or sometimes we imagine that we are simply not good enough when actually Jesus tells us that we are, that he loves us and that he has given us gifts and talents that are to be used for building up his church and his kingdom. What about passion? Maybe you get excited about the wrong things. Maybe the great love of your life is not God and he's saying, would you just come home? What about commitment? Now, I remember a saying when I was young that there's many people who call God Father on a Sunday act like orphans for the rest of the week. And maybe God is calling you and me to find even just a few minutes every day to spend with him to make sure that we stay connected to the vine. What about relationships? Some of those relationships that we have are not good for us. And perhaps we need to draw away for a time. Or perhaps it's the opposite and we're supposed to build a relationship with someone who will encourage us and support us and whom we also can encourage and support. What about service? Maybe you've not yet committed yourself to serving in the church and God's saying, actually, there are things that you can give even in this time of lockdown. Maybe you have technical uh, computer IT skills that would be really helpful for those of us who are struggling to work out how to produce videos and uh, Facebook posts. What about your motives? Do you tell people how busy you are so that you look good? Did you take on a role in the life of the congregation because you liked the title or thought it would make you look better? Are your motives right? Being disconnected produces nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. And apart from me, you can do nothing. And he says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burnt. When we disconnect, what happens is that we end up producing things that lead to death. And we can become judgmental, critical, harsh, unkind and bitter. Have you ever looked at someone and thought, I would never do that? The truth is that anybody is capable of anything when we disconnect 
from the vine. So how do we stay connected to the vine? Well, there are some pretty obvious ways. Reading the Bible, prayer, coming to worship, even if it's online. But what about this? What about doing what Jesus says? If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, he says in John 15, 10. It's like a parent asking their child to go and clean their room. The child goes away and comes back. Did you clean your room? Well, I memorised what you said about cleaning my room. Uh Uh-huh, but did you clean your room? Ah, well, I made notes in Hebrew so that I would remember what you said about cleaning my room. Uh Uh-huh, but did you clean your room? I got four friends together and we went for coffee and discussed what you meant when you said clean your room. And we studied the word clean in Greek and it's clinio, which means clean in haste and with much fortitude. But did you clean your room? We went to a conference where someone told us how to clean more effectively. But did you clean your room? Sometimes, you see, we just need to clean the room. Maybe God's been telling you something for a long time and you've read it and your friend has said it and a preacher has preached it and you're like, oh, I don't know. Well, will you today just be obedient to God? Will you decide to stay connected to him by being obedient to what he said and what he says in his word? And then there's loving like Jesus. John 15, 12, he says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And I want you to note that he doesn't just say love each other because that's quite subjective. We all might understand that in different ways, but what he says is love each other as I have loved you. And he gave his own life for you and for me. He loved us that much. For Jesus' friends, the problem is that they had been arguing about which one was the greatest for years. Even on the way to Jerusalem, when Jesus had told them he was going there and he was going to be killed, they were arguing about it. Then we see that just before the Passover feast, Jesus got them together and It says he knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And he washed their feet. The King of glory washed their feet. And the point is that loving like Jesus loves involves sacrifice. Because we need then to put the interests of others before our own interests. Instead of looking down on people, we should be determined to raise them up. And it's in that context that he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you want to remain in my love, keep my commands. In other words, do what I say. And he goes on in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus raises the standard so high, love each other as I have loved you. And here's why he didn't give a long list of things that we're supposed to do. Because in our own, we can't manage it. We are incapable of loving like Jesus loved, unless, We are connected to him, the vine. But when we stay connected, fruit starts to happen. It begins to grow. It begins to appear. And we can learn to love others as he loved us. And it draws us back into the vine. And more fruit is produced. And that allows us to love others as he has loved us. And that produces more fruit. And so on. I said earlier that I sometimes wonder where the fruit is can be seen in my life. I'm sure there would be more if I spent more time on my connection with Jesus. At the end of the day, when a tree bears great fruit, you don't say, wow, the branch looks great. 
You look at the tree, you look at the vine, you look at the fruit. And so my question today for all of us is this. Are you bearing fruit for Jesus? We're going to take just a few moments to think about that. In today's prayers, I'm going to read through Psalm 23 and I'm adding various translations of the text. So it will seem slightly repetitive as we explore how different translations use the text. And while I'm reading it, because it's so familiar, I want to get you to hold in your hearts and minds the people that you are praying for during this season between Ascension and Pentecost. And if you don't have five people that you've already chosen to pray for daily, could you just think of one or two people just now and just hold them in your heart and mind as we go through Psalm 23 together. Let us pray. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing, I shall not want. I have all that I need. I always have more than enough. He cares for me always. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He makes me lie down in fresh, tender green pastures. He leads me beside the still and restful waters. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He provides me rest in rich green fields beside streams of refreshing water. He soothes my fears. He refreshes my soul. He refreshes and restores my life. He gives me new strength. He revives my life. He makes me whole again. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. For the good of his name, he leads me on paths that are right. He guides me along right paths, bringing honour to his name. He guides me in the right paths as he has promised. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Even if I walk through a very dark valley, I will not be afraid, because you are with me. Your rod and your shepherd's staff comfort me. Even when walking through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me, guarding, guiding all the way. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honour me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. You prepare a meal for me in front of my enemies. You pour oil of blessing on my head. You give me more than I can hold. You spread out a table before me, provisions in the midst of attack from my enemies. You care for all my needs, 
anointing my head with soothing, fragrant oil, filling my cup up again and again with your grace. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Certainly, goodness and mercy will stay close to me all the days of my life, and I will remain in the Lord's house for days without end. Your kindness and love will always be with me each day of my life, and I will live forever in your house, Lord. Certainly, your faithful protection and loving provision will pursue me wherever I go always, everywhere. I will always be with the Eternal in your house forever. Amen. kingdom come Lord teach us how to pray for all to know your joy your peace and love and know your friendship each and every day the breath of Christ the Father's gem so God Yeah. 
So I really love that hymn. It's been written specially for this year, for Thy Kingdom Come. The 10 days leading up to Pentecost. Pentecost, when the church remembers that there was a day after Jesus had gone back to heaven at Ascension, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on his friends and the church was born that day. It's the, the, the birthday of, uh, of the church. And as we come to the end of our time of worship together, it's a good reminder. You see, as Jesus calls us to be connected with him so that we can produce fruit. We know that only happens because the Holy Spirit helps us to do it. It's not something we can do on our own. And in these days leading to Pentecost, we've been praying that God's kingdom would come. That we would see more of him in our lives and the lives of our friends and our community. That the world would be changed. And actually it's a reminder that the world changes because people produce the kind of fruit that Jesus gives. You and I can do that, not in our own strength, but in his. So as we pray for our five friends or family members who don't yet know Jesus, we have to set an example for them. And that's a real challenge. But it's good that God is there to help us with it. And so let's pray together as we close today. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that we have been able to spend this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to gather in this way. And we pray that as we go from this time to whatever this day and this week brings, that you would go with us and that you would help us to produce fruit that we would become more like Jesus and in that way that your kingdom would come in the world. But Father, we want so much more than we can produce. We pray that you would pour out your spirit afresh and again in these days as you did on that first day of Pentecost. That you would give us more than we could ask or imagine. Father, we thank you for all you've done and for all you've still to do in the world and in us. And we ask you now to go with us. In Jesus' name, amen.